Content warning, gun violence and apartheid. Dang old far, far future, the males get out there and invent the hyperdrive of mankind spread, spread out, spread out the star, man. Everyone, everyone in Texas, I mean, get, get, get out and out the old dang old Capital, Capital Four, call it, call it New Texas, go, go to society, get them society based on, on ranch, man, and giant, giant critters that they go dig a super cattle, super, super everything, man, shooting everything, man, lost planet. Look at, look at, look out politicians, man, man, I'll tell you what. Yep. Yep. Mm-hmm. Action! Excitement! Horror! Romance! Thrills and chills! Swords and sorcery! Rockets and ray guns! A dizzying panoply of the strange and impossible from the darkest depths of the human imagination! What mad universe encompasses such tales as these? Join us as we bear witness to the sweeping sprawl of all the history that never was and all the futures that could yet be. It's adventure as you like it on What What Mad Universe. It had been the dissatisfied, of course, the discontented, the dreamers who had led the vanguard of man's explosion into space following the discovery of the hyperspace drive. They had gone from Terra, cherishing dreams of ways of life that had been dumped into the dustbin of history, or that had never really been. Then, in their new life, on new planets, they had set to work making those dreams and those pictures live. And many times, they had come close to succeeding. These Texans now, they had left behind the cold fact that it had been their state's great industrial complex that had made their migration possible. They ignored the fact that their life here on Capilla 4 was possible only by application of modern industrial technology. That rodeo down the plaza? Tank tilting instead of bronco busting. Here they were, living frozen in a romantic dream, a world of roving cowboys and ranch kingdoms. Hi, welcome to What Mad Universe. I'm Adam. I'm Philip. Hi. So today, howdy. Yeah. So today we're talking about uh, a bit of a weird little uh, curly cue called um, uh, either Lone Star Planet or a planet for Texans. It might even have other names. Actually, I'm not even sure about. Um, uh, I've only come across those two, but it's possible. Yeah, and it was published. It was. It's a. It's quite a short novel. Uh, it was published, I believe, uh, back in the back in the fifties. It said used- fifty-seven. Yeah, 57 it was published, uh, and it was published as a double uh, novel, like they used to sometimes publish novels as, uh, you know, like short novels, uh, two, to a, two to a book by the same publisher, uh, so it was published with an Andre Norton novel as well, um, but uh, yeah, this is uh, by uh, L- uh, A Planet for Texans by uh, H... H. Beam Piper and John J. McGuire. John J. McGuire, yeah, there you go. Who are not prolific authors, as far as we can tell, but uh, they seem to have a bit out there. And well, this is Piper a, does anyway. Yeah, I guess Piper has a bit of a uh, of the two. <laughs> when you look at Wikipedia, uh, Piper has a uh, has a decent, decently substantial Wikipedia page, and uh, McGuire does not. So that may tell you something there. Um, but it's very much of the pulp uh, pulp variety, and. Um, it's of the genre called the space western, which um, Phil has been informing me about. Uh, of course, it's pretty straightforward what it is, but um, Phil, tell tell us about the space western genre. Yeah, well, it's hard to pinpoint when it started because it's it's always hard to pinpoint starts of genres. You know, people say Mary Shelley invented science fiction, but you know, it goes back further. Right. Um, but uh, one of the early examples of the space western, one of the earliest that I could find references to, are uh, the Northwest Smith series from the 1930s by C.L. Moore, uh, which featured some sort of rugged Han Solo-esque character as a main character, uh, Northwest Smith. Um, that's one I'd like to do in a future episode, because I haven't read those yet, but they look interesting, and it's a female author, so that's, that's a good break from 
all the white dudes, like we said last week. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, no, so, sorry, you said he was a Han Solo type character, so he's an outlaw, would you say? In those, I think or? so. I, I don't know. I haven't read them yet, so. Yeah, right. Okay, obviously I haven't read them, you can't say, but yeah. Yeah, I, from my understanding, it's like a, a smuggler or something. Okay, all right. Well, makes sense. No, for sure. Um, yeah, space westerns uh, probably came about because, um, well, westerns were very popular, and a lot of the sci-fi writers also wrote for western ma- magazines mm. and novels and so forth. So there was quite a bit of crossover, so it makes sense that uh, they start mixing them. Right. Obviously, uh, yeah, Stylistically exactly. and in terms of, you know, just putting, like... Uh, by 1950, it had become a complete cliché, apparently. Um, a magazine called Galaxy Science Fiction actually advertised itself by saying it didn't have any space western stories. <laughs> um, and it... Um, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it... Uh, it um, Jets blasting, Bat Durston came screeching down through the atmosphere of blah, 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 whatever. Uh, a tiny planet seven billion light years from Sol. He cut out his hyperdrive for the landing, and at that point a tall, lean spaceman stepped out of the tail assembly, proton gun blaster in a space tanned hand. Get back from those controls, Bat Durston. The tall stranger lifts, lifts thinly. You don't know it, but this is your last space trip. Sound alike? They should. But one is merely a Western, transplanted to some alien and possible planet. If this is your idea of science fiction, you're welcome to it. You'll never find it in Galaxy! That's what the ad <laughs> says. <laughs> so, yeah, as you say, it, it was clearly something people were, well, some people were probably getting sick of as a <laughs> as a go-to by the, by the yeah, 50s. And, yeah, and and now it's, it's, it's still going on. I mean, um, sure. uh, Firefly uh, from the early 2000s uh, i just saw mm-hmm. an episode of a cartoon called uh, galaxy rangers okay it's explicitly just cowboys in space like they ride robot horses and right it's it was terrible cowboy well you know it's kind of fun i feel i feel like that's the kind of thing where you know once a once once a generation you could have something along those lines and of yeah. course there's cowboy bebop's cowboy often bebop. referenced as it but it's only sort of like that for like one episode but yeah yeah it yeah, that's right. It is funny that that's called. They go, they say Cowboy Bebop, and oh, it's all cowboy, but it's not really that Western compared to some of the other things, which are very literally Westerns in space. I always yeah. found it amusing that, uh, you know, a lot of critics writing often somewhat contemptuously about Star Wars go, oh, yes, in a Western in space. And I mean, there's a stretch of the first Star Wars movie that's basically a Western in space. Uh, when they go to the cantina, essentially. Uh, but only very... And I guess you could argue Luke out on the range, kind of. Uh, but only very vaguely is it a space western. And then I guess Solo has a train robbery as well. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, Star Trek is often described as a space western with all the... Uh, right. Uh, the wagon trails to the stars sort of thing. Right. Well, that w- as I understand it, what they did was the executives told Gene Roddenberry, we want to... We want to show that is Wagon Train, which was a popular uh, Western TV show, uh, which was obviously, as it would suggest, about settlers traveling west in a wagon train. We want that in outer space. Um, and Gene Roddenberry said, sure, I'll do it. And then he made Star Trek, which isn't really Wagon Train to the Stars at all. It has no the, the very little connection to that. Mm-hmm. And then uh, the irony is that when Battlestar Galactica came along, the 1970s yeah. version, that really is bat- Wagon Train to the Stars. They, they said, okay, we're going to do what Star Trek was supposed to be, basically. So yeah. that was kind of funny. Um, yeah, so this, this novel, um, I first encountered it as a teenager, actually. Um, it was on a forum. Somebody just posted the cover. It's like a, um, you know, memes or, you know, memes or whatever you would have called them at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, sort of just joke things. That, uh, Posting. That, I yeah. Know, I have to I'm not sure if we can say that. that. I was trying to yes. around. I'll bleep it, but... it out. Bleep it out. <laughs> but yes, okay. you're right. We shouldn't say um, that. Yes. Yeah. So it was um, uh, the cover. Uh, we'll probably post it in various places, but it's um, it's. It says a planet for Texans, and there's a giant cow, like, um, not quite kaiju size, but like a really, really big cow, and there's a sort of airship running away from it. And um, I wasn't sure if it was a real thing or like a parody or something, and I wasn't, I, I sort of put it out of mind, you know, I didn't think about it, I didn't bother looking into it, but uh, 
years, decade, like a decade later, I was browsing on uh, LibriVox, which has uh, public domain audiobooks uh, read by volunteers. I highly recommend that service. Um, it's free and everything. Um, I was browsing the science fiction section, and I came across a book called Lone Star Planet that seemed to have the same sort of feel to it. And then I found out it's the same book, just published under a different name. Mm -hmm. So I read it, and uh, I was surprised. It's not, it's not quite like advertised. Uh, it, it no it's sort of the way it looks is like a or you describe it. You know, a, a planet te settled by Texans and there's giant cows. You'd think it's an adventure story, but it's not really. It's yeah, so it's a legal. It's drama. a political drama <laughs> with some courtroom drama and yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Space opera and, and, elements in the background. And and as you say, it's almost because you almost wonder if because that was such a cliche at that point, uh, the the space western that they could then do a legal drama that was set within the space western genre. <laughs> yeah. And um but yeah, no, it's not it's not a I mean there are shootouts and things, but it's not yeah. um it's not what you would expect when you say space western, you expect them robbing trains and riding on the the range or the space range or going to outer space or whatever. Um, and yeah. it's much more about, um, it's actually what this actually seems to have been a bit of a subgenre as well, or a sub subgenre either, uh, in 50 sci-fi. Um, well, not 50 sci-fi, sci-fi in general, but, uh, it, it, it seems to have really picked up in the post-war period, which is the idea of being a diplomatic, uh, envoy, uh, to a planet in some capacity or another and having to make sense of the local customs and getting into trouble often because of the crazy local customs. Whether it's a human colonized planet or a group of aliens that you have to uh, coordinate, it's it, it, that has been, uh, you know, I've been reading science fiction since the 80s and that is a very much a staple of the genre. The whole, I came to a planet, I came to solve some problem, but I didn't, nobody really knows why it's a problem. Oops, as we, you know, as I spend some time on the planet, I realize there's a whole weird cultural thing that nobody understood, so I've got to sort it out. So, yeah, it's uh, like half the Star Trek episodes. Right, yeah, Star Trek was definitely somewhat inspired by that. But just to describe this basic story here, so people know what we're talking about, um, it's... Uh, Here's an excerpt from the book uh, Phil put up. They had found Capella 4, a Terra-type planet with a slightly higher mean temperature, a lower mass and lower gravitational field, about one quarter water and three quarters land surface at a stage of evolutionary development approximately that of Terra during the late Pliocene. They also found Super Cow, a big mammal looking like the unsuccessful attempt of a hippopotamus to impersonate a Dachshund and about the size of a nuclear steam locomotive. On New Texas plains, there were billions of them. Their meat was fit for the gods of Olympus. So New Texas had become the meat supply player to the galaxy. And this was a planet settled literally by the state of Texas going into outer space and finding their own planet where, of course, the government wouldn't hassle them and they could have, you know, Texas rot larger than it usually is. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so it's about uh, uh, Stephen Silk, who's an, uh, uh, a diplomat who comes from the Solar League, obviously. The, the well, he's demoted to diplomat at the beginning of the story. Right, yeah, he's actually in trouble, so he's he's banished to a faraway world. But he's uh, he represents basically what could be called essentially the Federation. Um, and, of course, Texas does not want to join the Federation because they are Texan in spirit, and they're kind of, uh, you know... They're independence-minded, which is why they left Earth in the first place. Um, and so he has to go there and basically solve the... Not not really solve the murder, but uh, deal with the murder of the last uh, ambassador. That's the main uh, subplot, right? Yeah, yeah. And um, uh, we should get to this. The uh, New Texas government is based on the idea that you're allowed to assassinate politicians if they go too far. Right. Uh, it's based on a... Um, uh, suggestion by uh, H.L. Mencken, the uh, uh, humorist, uh, in his essay, uh, The Malevolent Job Holder. Um, I won't mm -hmm. read the whole thing, but it's basically what I, what I just said. Uh, don't let the government get too big because, um, you know, it'll, it'll oppress you. So if, uh, if a politician oversteps his bounds, it should be considered okay to, uh, to do whatever you want to them. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and once you're, and you get tried afterwards and, um, on New Texas in the Court of Criminal Justice, but the trial is basically a trial of the victim, right? Um, to see if they had it coming, and <laughs> yeah, exactly. if the severity was in proportion to what they did, right? So, like, if they try to raise taxes, um, you're allowed to just 
kill them. Yep. Yep. And um and it's it's encouraged to do that. Uh not necessary well, they say it's not because they don't it's not because they want to lose money according to them. It's just because they don't want the government to get any power. Right. Yeah, they're a little <laughs> they go a little back and forth on it, but yeah, and it's and it's funny because it's portrayed as completely insane initially and then they kind of almost painted as well maybe this is a good thing later on so they they kind of go back and forth um yeah they describe uh the system as a um uh sort of a modern feudalism uh so the ranch owners uh it once again super cow is like the meat uh the meat that the whole galaxy eats and um um but they're so large and so uh, invulnerable, you have to herd them with fighter planes and tanks. <laughs> so every ranch owner has like a small army at its disposal. Um, right. So um, uh, it's basically, like I said, feudalism uh, by owned by these ranchers. But they can't overstep their bounds either because all their men know each other and will organize or whatever. That That's right. the idea anyway. <laughs> it's yeah. not... I don't know how well that would work, but it's it works within the context of the novel. So yeah, I mean it's 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 sort of ludicrous enough and and whimsical and satirical enough that you know I don't think the authors were promoting it as oh yeah this is an actually good way to run your <laughs> your planet. Yeah. Um, although they do have you know the the hero he essentially comes around to them by the end of the story. He's basically like yeah I like this way of li of life. Um, mm -hmm. in practical, you know, it's, it, it is hard to get away from a certain, uh, you know, Ayn Rand feeling. She also advocated, you know, killing politicians who got, who, who started to get in your way if you wanted to do things basically. And mm -hmm. I mean, the, the funny thing is that the real wild west, uh, didn't work that way. <laughs> you know, it was, it, yeah. it's proposal as if that's how the wild west is going to work. But I mean, they were famously, well, they weren't famous because we've kind of, erased it from history, but they, the ranch owners and the big railroad barons, uh, did a lot of union crushing and making sure their, their, you know, their workers wouldn't rise up against them so they could live like oligarchs. So unfortunately, I don't think that would work in any way, shape or form in real life. But this is, again, this is kind of meant to be a bit ridiculous. It's not necessarily meant to be. Yeah. Yet. Yeah. It's, it has a very whimsical tone. Right. And, um, and it's, uh, you know, it's like, I, I mean, obviously just the whole, well, that, as I say, that's as you say, like because space western was a genre at that point, um, you know, the inherent ridiculousness of it maybe might have been muted a bit at the time because people had read so many cowboys in outer space stories at that point that maybe they did. Yeah, it, it, maybe they were willing to take it a little more seriously than we might be reading it. But, uh, but it's 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 a it's it's a often humorous kind of whimsical book. So I don't, you know, the the authors clearly weren't taking it too seriously either. So. Mm -hmm. So it, it does, it does, it's an interesting book. I really enjoyed it. I was uh, surprised by a lot of it. There's the idea that um, the Texans are recreating a way of life that n might never have really existed. Right, yeah. Um, they uh, they brought the Alamo brick by brick and rebuilt it on New <laughs> Texas. Yeah, yeah. Um, he, he and, almost gets uh, into trouble for saying, hey, look at that, you've made a perfect replica of the Alamo. And they're like, don't say that, that's the actual Alamo. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, and, um, uh, oh, I can't remember, but there, there's a funny bit where he's given the national uniform that he wants, that he's uh, told to wear, and um, he says, uh, denim trousers that for some obscure reason are called Levi's. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, it's all, and, and even the passage I read at the beginning there, um, he the next line, I left it out, but he talks about how his, uh, quote, bodyguard, who may be trying to kill him, um, was giving him a, you know, he said he didn't like, uh, he didn't like reading about other people's reporting on Texas because it sort of shattered the idea that, oh, we've perfectly replicated what Texas was like in the, the 19th century because it, they hadn't. Like, <laughs> yeah. very explicitly, it's an attempt to recreate the past rather than an actual correct version of the past, right? Yeah, and like you said in the reading, they um, it their whole way of life relies on the mechanization they've managed to... Um, Get, but their their way of life involves pretending that that doesn't exist. Right, exactly. 
which is a nice a nice point to make i think there <laughs> so that was yeah that, that was kind of good um so you know he he becomes sympathetic to them ultimately but yeah there's there's enough sort of well we're not going to talk about this as a as a utopian society by any means um yeah there's also a nice bit of satire in one part where um there's an ambassador from a south african nationalist planet mm-hmm. um who um and it says that they were a frustrated lot because they had gone to space to practice apartheid apartheid right uh, but they settled on a planet where there was no intelligent race to be superior to. <laughs> yeah, I just thought that was amusing. Yeah, no, it's it's clearly coming from a uh, you know a a, a, a mid century liberal viewpoint. I guess would be mm-hmm. the general politics, uh, which is of course the same thing that ended up birthing Star Trek and the Twilight Zone and everything like that. I think. Um, it's, Although it, I mean, this is in the fifties. Apartheid went on for quite a bit after that. So oh yeah, of course. Interesting. Well, of course, but I mean, it was, I mean, it's, it's an American comment or Americans commenting on apartheid. Yeah. Well, maybe we can, uh, we can talk about it. Like, um, as we say, the story ends up being a legal drama. Uh, the, the main question then becomes, because the last, uh, ambassador sent by the Solar League was murdered and they bring it to political court like they do any time a politician is killed. And uh, Silk, the main character, goes, well, guys, don't you understand the problem here? If we're going to consider diplomats to be politicians, uh, that's going to raise a whole, which means, of course, that they can be killed for overstepping their bounds. That's going to create a whole ton of problems, including possibly whether this, uh, you know, we're ever going to have any dealings with this with this planet, because anyone who comes to the planet to be a diplomat could be murdered legally. Uh, that that's going to create some problems. And uh, as at the, the same time, he can't. Uh, he can't allow them to go free because uh, that'll make the Solar League look bad in New Texas eyes and make them right. look weak all over the galaxy. Right. So they're in kind of a, a legal pickle, and that is that is the, the thrust of the story. Um, and there's they, also a uh, the background of an invasion by the Sisraf, which are right. a race that uh, of humanoids that descended from dogs, right, or canine like creatures. Yeah. And, the, the, um, the 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 the, ten, the sense on uh, New Texas Capella Four is. Uh, there's some of them who want to be, be, of course, blatantly independent, but some of them realize that they, they're going to need to, you know, uh, become part of the Solar League in order to defend themselves against the Sisraf, uh, these alien potential invaders, although they're not, they're not too big. <laughs> they're not too aggressive. They kind of they're they're you know they're 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 doing diplomatic stuff as well. They're not just pointing their guns at the at the the planet. Or yeah, anything. it's like there's a secret invasion that's about to happen, basically. Right. In, over the course of the story, right? They're they're kind of waiting for their moment, basically. Um, but then, so anyway, so then it becomes. Oh, uh, and of course, they organized the the hit on the on the previous ambassador. Right. Yeah, it's pretty clear, pretty fast that they wanted the ambassador killed so that Texas would not join the Solar League. Uh, New Texas would not join the Solar League, and they could invade without. You know, because New Texas, of course, doesn't have a fleet of ships to defend themselves. So, um, so it's to, it's about swinging, you know, popular opinion on New Texas towards joining the Solar League and thereby preventing them from being attacked. Uh, and and about half the book is this legal drama that. Uh, and again, when I say half the book, it's a it's a pretty short book. It's a novella almost more than a novel. Um, I'd say it's definitely a novella. Yeah. Yeah, it's it was the version we had was like eighty largish pages, but uh, yeah, exactly. Um, so but it, the interesting thing, so as we say, space westerns were a genre at that time, uh, but it is actually interesting that um, legal dramas uh, seem to have exploded in American pop culture right about that time. Um, it, it, like uh, Perry Mason uh, hit TV right at the same year that this book came out, uh, and so were movies 12 Angry Men and Witness for the Prosecution. Um, I think Perry Mason had been on radio before it was a TV show. Uh, so legal dramas were kind of building throughout the 50s, and that kind of became one of the big didactic uh, forms of storytelling that where, you know, people could talk about right and wrong and judge moral, you know, issues, basically. So there, it, it seems like legal dramas exploded in the late 50s. So in a sense, this is combining not two, but three genres <laughs> that were really popular at the time. So it was really hedging its bets. Yeah, and... Um... You mentioned it's uh, it's similar in tone to What Mad Universe, the book that we covered in our first episode. Right. Yeah. It's. I mean, of, um, what I mean is is that it, it um, it's similar. Like it in to- What Mad Universe is a bit more of a 
straight comedy in some ways. Well, it's not, a, except it's not a straight comedy, but it's a little bit more wacky, I would say, than this book, mm -hmm. uh, even though this book is a little bit wacky as well. But it, there's just a sense to me that if you'd read pulp sci-fi in the 20s and 30s, and before in the 19th century, it would have been treated somewhat like straight-facedly, as it were, uh, whereas in this we're getting to this post-war era and it feels like there's a bit more sophistication and wit and detachment from the source material and kind of, uh, kind of deconstructing it a little bit, uh, that I feels like it's unique to the fifties. Wouldn't you say? Uh, yeah. I mean, what mad universe was 49, but it's practically the fifties. Right. I'm well, like I said, post-war years, basically world war two, yeah. Uh, we're getting to the era of, you know, film noir being popular, you know, biblical spectaculars at the film at the at the cinema, TV starting to take off. Like right as this uh, this book was published, it was sort of we were really getting to the era of TV, that kind of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, there's a there's a shift in the approach towards the audience. I would say, like I I would say pre World War Two again, not without. I don't know personally, like a huge overview of this of of the the genre. I don't want to say definitively, but I feel like you wouldn't get this kind of winking cleverness and whimsy to it in quite the same way you would in twenties and thirties. Twenties and thirties, I think it was a little bit more, um, you know, a little bit more straight I'm, laced. Straight laced, but also it was it was for mass audience, and it was kind of like, well, they wouldn't understand, like what. The, the premise of What Mad Universe, you know, if you haven't listened to our first show, which you really should, is uh, about a guy falling into a world that is exactly like the pulp magazines, which he, because he's an ed a pulp editor, and it's exactly like the sci-fi magazines he edits. And that kind of, you know, uh, commentary on the genre, like meta-commentary, I can't imagine that being in the World War II era, because I think it was seen more as, no, we're just grinding out content uh, for you know the the and the pulps were for the mass audience. They weren't. They were for the lower classes, I guess, if that's fair to say. Uh, does that is that unreasonable? Do you think I for um, me to say? That? Yeah, I think you can make that argument. Um, I'm not sure, but yeah. Whereas with the World reasonable. War II, after World War II, you suddenly see the the rise of the middle class, and you get this kind of middle brow audience, which might be a little more amenable to this. I think that's what we're seeing uh, here. I think it might also be uh, the specialization of, uh, like, the sci-fi fan as a thing. Right, yeah, that's true, too. Like, it's, um, like, fandom started popping up around this time, so it's, it's like, uh, there's a, mm -hmm. there's a type of reader that will specifically want this type of material. Right, right. Well, I, I mean, I, the science fiction fans existed going back to the 19th century, I'd say, for sure. I, uh, yeah, but it's not, it wasn't as, uh, like, a, I guess, nerdy subculture as much as it became. Right, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I always like to pin the actual rise of the sci-fi fan, uh, particularly to the late 60s and 70s. Um, like that's where what we think of as nerd fandom culture really came to start. But it's true that yeah. there were definitely fa like sci-fi fans in the forties and fifties. Uh, John W. Campbell and amazing, or sorry, astounding, um, were definitely, um, uh, they, 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 he had a, a strong following in that era. And so you're right. That was kind of the first generation of, uh, real sci-fi fans, as opposed to just everyone reading sci-fi, you know? Um, from what I can understand. Mm. But yeah, I, I think there was a, a bit of a cultural division happening uh, post-World War II where suddenly there were, you know, middle-class people who aspired to be more highbrow and might have sniffed at science fiction versus people who were maybe a little bit more willing to follow their nerdy interests, as it were. <laughs> uh, well, I wanted to talk a bit about the uh, this sort of sci-fi elements. Um, sure. In specific, say we already discussed the super cows, which um, um, on the cover they're just regular looking cows, but really big. But uh, in the book, like uh, you read earlier, they're sort of um, a mix between a dachshund and a um, hippopotamus, but the size of a, a locomotive. So that's that's interesting. Um, a nuclear steam just, locomotive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whatever that is. I don't know. Um, I guess a fancy future thing. Um, oh, by the way, this story takes place approximately 200 years in the future. Mm -hmm. um, and there seems to be uh, some sort of 
I mean, the the Solar League is sort of like the Federation, but a bit more, a bit less egalitarian. Yeah, maybe. I mean, we don't get a lot of, you know, it's not seems... a lot, but I get the feeling they're they're a little more. I don't know. Um, Bureaucratic, sure. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. Uh, there, there's a uh, there's a slight suggestion that at one time they were more. Um, because they gave the Sisroff the uh, hyperdrive, you know, because they were just being generous, but uh, right. they don't do that anymore. Oh, yeah, I didn't mean to suggest that they were, like, as utopian as Star Trek. Just the idea that it was a, you know, a gang of worlds who at all, who are operating together, uh, not necessarily yeah. without the usual political and bureaucratic struggles that you would get from that. <laughs> so I just thought it was interesting that they sort of, it seems that the, this, the Solar League... Um, tried to be the uh, Star Trek Federation for a bit, but it just didn't go their way, so they, uh... Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, so, New Texas also has, in addition to super cows, uh, um, they have, uh, super yams that they make super bourbon out of. <laughs> um, it, it briefly mentions super macedons as an animal that gets hunted. Yeah. And, um... There's which super are, doves, which are used for shooting practice. Yeah, uh, I mean, there's a the, line that says uh, everything on New Texas was super something. Yeah, if the super cows were the size of like tanks or larger, I can't imagine what the super mastodons are like. It must be, yeah. you know, walk land whales basically. So, yeah, I'm imagining like Godzilla size or something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, what what do they hunt them with again? What do they use for uh, those? Like it was uh, like a fancy futuristic rifle from the Sisroff planets, I think. Right, right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they, I mean, it's obviously the everything's bigger in Texas thing, but mm -hmm. put on yeah, that's the a, joke. to a ridiculous, whimsical level. Yeah, that's the the cliche of Texas as emerged in pop culture, especially around this period, was just the joke that you know. Uh, Texans always, they bragged nonstop, uh, and especially about how huge everything was, how huge Texas was, and how huge cows were, and how huge, there's a, there's actually the joke about the Texan who went to to uh, Australia, and, you know, they he'd say, you know, oh, hey, look, you're a cow, and he's like, shoot, boy, we got dogs bigger than that back in Texas, and he showed them his, you know, his uh, sheep, and he said, shoot, boy, we got pigs bigger than that back in Texas, and then he saw some kangaroos jumping by and he said well you got some mighty fine grasshoppers out here though <laughs> anyway, so there's that but yeah that's that's the 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 as it were the henny youngman borscht belt comedian or the you know cat skills yeah. type joke about texas is that's the that's the cliche yeah but it's it sort of it like i said it's sort of a satirical mm -hmm. feeling to this book yeah it's um, it's they knew it, and that, and like I say, that's the thing. The fact that this was, uh, you know, a, as we all know, pulp writers were kind of by the by the early twentieth century, they were really grinding out the stories, you know, to get you know a few cents a word or whatever the the pay rate was at that particular time. Um, so they would often really grind them out really fast. Uh, but so it is funny that this is probably something along the same lines. It was oh, I get paid by the word. I get I crank this out and and fill up my uh, my portfolio and get paid. But um, there's more of a, instead of just, yeah, let's write to a formula, it's more, <laughs> let's kind of wink at the formula. And you had to do yeah. something a little more clever than just do another, as, as, as that Galaxy ad that we quoted earlier said, you know, just transpose the, the Western into outer space, basically. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, you seem to uncover that, uh, I haven't read any of H. Beam Piper's other stuff, but... Uh... You said he wrote one about space Vikings. Yeah, he did. Uh, it sounds like this guy. Yeah, he he he. It sounds like he liked the idea of his using history and transposing it to outer space. Which I mean, he was hardly the first one to do that. But uh, he apparently wrote a series about the space Viking, um, or rather, he wrote a novel called The Space Viking, which may have been turned into a series. I'm actually a little vague on this because apparently other people picked up and wrote his characters, uh, which is a little odd. Uh, John F. Carr was a guy who kept writing space Viking stories, uh, as the, as it, as it continued. Um, I, I have no idea if he actually went, oh, I love, uh, I love this obscure author so much that I'm going to continue his series, or if it was just a case of something that 
and you know he gave his blessing to. There's only one well, space. Viking Lone Star story. Planet is in the public domain for some reason. It uh, they didn't renew the copyright, so it's um, hmm. it's free to use for anything. Yeah, that that makes a certain amount of sense uh, because you know there's <laughs> there a lot of this stuff just nobody bothered to keep the ownership. Uh, you know, public domain the length can extend pretty far if people want to renew the copyright, but if they don't care about renewing the copyright, uh, it does sound like things from the mid fifties are no longer, uh, if, if nobody owned them, like I, I was actually researching the Nador comics line, uh, which went up to the, the mid fifties. And it sounds like Nador went out of business in the fifties, I think. Um, and it sounds like nobody bothered to pick up their intellectual property. So it is still, you know, and I, and I believe it was, uh, 25 years later, it would become public domain if nobody bothered to renew it, and nobody did. So this is probably in the same uh, in yeah. the same uh, general vicinity as that. Uh, he also wrote something called the Ellar Uprising, which is apparently a sci-fi version of the uh, the Great Indian um, uh, Revolt in the mid 19th century against the uh, East India uh, Tea Company. Um, so yeah, that's I mean obviously that's a pretty uh, that's a pretty good uh, source for things. I'm interested that H.B. Piper's career went into the 60s, uh, which I would say the pulp era kind of changed by that point. And you had to, you got a little more fantastical. People started to, uh, the pulp fantasy came back and he wrote something called Lord Calvin of Other When, which sounds very fantasy-esque to me. Hmm. Um, oh, no, I'm sorry. No, it's not a, a fantasy thing. It's uh, a guy being uh, transported to a parallel reality uh, and he's a cop, and it's about parallel reality cops. It sounds like. Oh. Yeah. That sounds interesting. Yeah, he's and he did. That's right. He did a whole series called the Paratime series, which is that uh, about cops who go between parallel realities, basically. Uh, but yeah, that's that's much more of a '60s thing, I think. Well, mm -hmm. see, again, we say Mad Universe. What Mad Universe was that was 1949, and it had alternate. But that realities. was ahead of its time in some ways. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Uh, I. It would be interesting to try and pin down when the parallel realities thing started to explode into pop culture. But we're getting a little off track, anyway, from uh, Lone Star Planet. Um, there are some really nice covers for this book. <laughs> yeah. It was published in Fantastic uh, Universe. That was the original publication place, by the way. It was published in uh, in the, the pulp magazine Fantastic Universe. Then it was published on its own, as I said, with the Andrew Norton novel... Um, What's the name? Star Lost, I believe it's called. Uh, hang yeah, on. and that's the cover that initially piqued my interest. I think. Right. Uh, any other? Any further thoughts at this point? Um, I, I guess not. It's it's a pretty short novel, so it mm -hmm. stands a reason it would be a short episode. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, uh, I, I'm I'm glad we talked about it because it's uh, I think it's worth reading and is worth uh, getting out there to people. Yeah, I, I this between this and what mad universe I kind of went, okay, it seems like the pulp the post-war pulp had a bit more, you know, whimsy and wit to it in some yeah. ways than the pre-World War II as I was saying. And this is making me want to dig up some of that <laughs> some of these kind of filler pulp stories from that era and thinking, oh, some of them might be kind of entertaining basically. So I, I yeah, this one I, I thought it was interesting. It has a it has a world that's sort of implied more than anything. Right. Uh, there, there's like a there's a lot of interesting world building in this story that I think could be expanded upon. You could yeah. do it because it's it's free to use. Yeah, and it's it, it is actually funny because you know well as you say I mean this seems like it was a genre that was almost it was almost played out even in 1957 and so he's just kind of going okay you've seen this kind of thing before so I'll give you some rough rough details and you can just fill in all the blanks yourself essentially yeah right? um, but not just the space western stuff but I mean the the galactic politics and all that it's just sort of right. implied but it what's what we do get is sort of tantalizing and interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, as with uh, a lot of genre stuff, it's always kind of, uh, you have to assume uh, that a certain trope because it's been done before and they're just, okay, we're riffing on this trope. It has some differences, which will illuminate, will, you know, will, will elucidate what the, the small differences are, but you can assume up to this point that there's a, basically an intergalactic UN, for instance, called the Solar mm -hmm. League. Even you know, Star Trek's Federation when it first came out was not a very original idea. That was that was a 
common idea that yeah basically the un in outer space would be a thing um so so and then if there's differences you can kind of the, the, the author will usually tell you about the differences whereas <laughs> the similarities you can just sort of assume right so yeah but yeah oh, it, uh, we didn't really discuss the ending um right where um he gets uh he actually gets the um the people who killed the previous ambassador off because they're because it wasn't a politician so it should have never been tried in this court but um right uh so but and everybody was mad at him because he let them go free but then he just shoots them right well it's literally like um for whatever i can't remember quite the legal maneuvering but it's like you know obviously there's a lot of people gunning each other there's a lot of frontier justice in this in this town and you know and it literally becomes the judge realizing that he's going to clear these guys he's going to bring his gavel dabble down and then a gunfight is going to erupt in the courtroom as soon as he hits the gavel so he's like we're court is out of session till nine o'clock tomorrow hit the floor bang <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then there's a shootout basically which is kind of hilarious and, um, yeah uh steven silk has as the edge both because he was raised on a planet with lots of violence, so he had to use it. He had to be trained in firearms, mm -hmm. but also because he has uh, special holsters that sort of eject the gun into his hands. <laughs> right, yeah. He's got the, the techno spring guns that come out into him. So, of course, he's the fast... And that's and that's basically how he ends up winning. He's sort of... There's a girl in the story who he was, who he was getting close to, and then she was getting disgusted with some of the political stuff he was doing and he ends up winning her and and the the, the people of new texans uh love because he's such a, a good shooter basically that's yeah that, that's what wins him over to their side ultimately he's such a he's such a, a fast shooter which is of course the classic western trope as well yeah so shall we wrap it up yeah it was a fun one uh do you uh do you recommend it i definitely oh yeah yeah no it's fun. i mean if you if it, it's it's a very it's a very throwaway uh book but yeah it, this as i said this is making me think that this era of pulp is uh probably very per, very fun and worth uh, checking out so i'll be yeah. delving into uh, that one now. last thing um about the book uh there's a character named wilbur waitley mm -hmm. um who's just it was the first uh person who shot a politician in the story that we're introduced to who gets away with it um and uh that's it's slightly spelled differently but there's a wilbur waitley in lovecraft he's the uh hmm. half human son of yogg's Soth in the dunwich horror so that's interesting i don't i i guess it would have to be a deliberate reference because really that's not I a don't common so. name wilbur yeah, waitley i don't think that might have i mean even if it was deliberate it's not there's no there's no reason to link it to Lovecraft specifically. Like, if there's nothing no, about him. No, but I don't know. That's Lovecraft. Uh, like, I, when when you see things like that, you kind of go, okay, if the author's being clever, it's because there's some, you know, nod to the author that he's homaging, or there's something about the story that makes you uh, nod to it. But in this case, I don't see any connection to Lovecraft, except maybe, maybe if you read his entire, uh, you know, bibliography, he'd have a ton of Lovecraft references just thrown in um, there. I, I don't know. Like I said, I, I just thought it was kind of odd yeah. reading it because I completely forgot about that when I yeah. uh, read it the first time. Well, uh, people on this planet as well, they, they get names like there's, they talk to one guy named David Crockett, uh, <laughs> right. Johnson or whatever. And you know, there's people that there's a, you know, there's a Sam Houston Phillips or something like that. <laughs> oh no, there's a Sam Houston Continent. Yeah, sorry, yes, the continents are the the Jim Bowie and Sam Co Houston continents, who are of course the heroes of the Alamo. Um, yeah, yeah, but uh, they had, uh, yeah, they 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 all have you know Texan names basically, exaggeratedly the same way you if you gave someone the name you know. Oh Franklin. yeah, there's a character's last name is Maverick. Right. Yeah, that's yeah. I don't know who the historical maverick was, if there was any historical maverick, but that's certainly. But it's an, a very Texan sort of name. Yeah, I mean, it was a. We know that I know that it was a TV show about maverick, but uh, I think it goes back further than that. Yeah. Anyway, okay. Um, uh, shall I wrap it up, or do you have anything else? Uh, yeah. Well, um, remember that uh, we both have Patreons, and you can listen to episodes a week early on there, and we also have other things, mm -hmm. comics related and art related and things. Yep. Um, yeah, go to our uh, Patreon links. your site, specifically? Yeah. Well, if you, if, yeah, you can go to our Patreon's uh, links, which are uh, at the si at the website, neversleepsnetwork.com slash what-mad-universe, 
Um, and if you're not already listening to it here, there, uh, the links are there. Uh, Phil has a comic called the Apex Society. Um, I have a I have a website, Phantasmic Tales with a PH, PhantasmicTales.com, uh, and that has links to all my comics that are there. And uh, Apex, other than Apex Society, Phil, was there anything you wanted to plug? Uh, not immediately. I, I will later, but right. Yeah. And uh, I guess we'll mention this now. We are. Uh, hope it, we're, we're, we're sort of in the early planning stages, but we'd like we're thinking we'll run a Kickstarter at some point over the summer uh, we'd like this show to go weekly and uh, to do that we, uh, uh, we've been doing it a bit guerrilla style but we, uh, we like to host it in uh, you know, uh, Alex Ross's studio uh, which does uh, require a certain amount of payment uh, so uh, we think we might be running a Kickstarter uh, in another month or so uh, so if you enjoy the show, we'd really love for you guys to get on board with that. Alternately, as you, as I say, you could uh, join our Patreon that we have. Um, we'll, we'll fill you in more about that in the upcoming uh, weeks to come. Well, buckaroos and owl hoots, I reckon it's time to saddle up and blow this planet. We are Two-Gun Adam Prosser and Deadeye Phil Rice. Theme song was by the singing cowboy Jack Fierick, and we want to wish a special thanks to Alex Yeehaw Ross, the, the orneriest audio engineer this side of the Orion Arm. <laughs> As we ride off into the Betelgeusean sunset, we wish happy trails to you and yours. Y'all come back now, you hear? <laughs>